Uh, one more time, give it up for our worship team. What a gift. That was good. I like it, man. My shoulders start moving. And, uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, what a joy to worship with you all, to sing with you all, to, to worship the name of Jesus and lift his name up here. For those of you watching online, it's a gift to have you join us. Wherever you're joining us from, uh, my name is Rich. I'm the lead pastor at New Life Fellowship Church here in Queens, New York City. And whether you're joining us from Facebook, newlife.nyc, on YouTube, uh, it is a joy to have you with us. We are in a series focusing on the deeply formed life, which is uh, uh, highlighting the five values that make up New Life Fellowship Church, the five areas of faith and spiritual formation and discipleship that we have given ourselves to over many, many years. And this is a wonderful series for those of us who have been coming to New Life for some time, especially for those of you who are coming to New Life uh, recently, maybe over the course of the pandemic and you started coming to New Life. This is a great opportunity to be uh, deeply rooted in the particular values that have made up our congregation. Last week, we talked about contemplative rhythms, the ways that we are to slow down, uh, to root ourselves in God's love and relationship with Jesus. Today, we're looking at racial reconciliation. It's our second M, racial reconciliation. And we are going to look at the book of Ephesians uh, chapter 2. In a world that continues to be uh, marked by racial hostility and injustice and fragmentation, uh, we're going to really hear a vision of what it looks like when the gospel gets a hold of a people, when the gospel gets a hold of an individual, when the gospel gets a hold of a community bearing witness to this life-changing message of Jesus Christ. And there's going to be a lot that I'm going to say. Like I said last week, I would encourage you to listen to this message at some point uh, this week again because there's going to be a lot of uh, just stuff to wrestle with. But we're looking at Ephesians Chapter 2, beginning at verse number 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul says, For he himself, that is Jesus, he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, that we would receive every gift you have for us this day. We pray these things in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want to begin our time by focusing on the gospel, focusing on the gospel. The way we understand the gospel will determine the degree to which we give ourselves to racial reconciliation. The degree to which we understand the gospel is the degree to which we will give ourselves to racial reconciliation. And so if the gospel exclusively is the message that you're going to heaven when you die, one can easily conclude that race, racism, and reconciliation could be an afterthought. If the gospel is about the forgiveness of sins, particularly personal forgiveness of sins, and if that's how we exclusively look at the gospel, it becomes permissible to ignore things like race, racism, and reconciliation. But what if, brothers and sisters, the gospel was something more? Something that, yes, embraces the truth of eternal life as found in Jesus Christ. The truth that, yes, we received the forgiveness of sins because of his love. But what if the gospel has something to do not just with the life to come, but with our life right now? The ways that we relate to one another, which is why I have been proposing a definition of the gospel that incorporates all of the things that I just talked about related to forgiveness, related to eternal life, and related to race reconciliation and all the ways that we are called to be a new humanity. What if the gospel is this? The good news that the kingdom of God has come near in Jesus Christ and that in his life, death, resurrection, and enthronement, the powers of sin and death no longer have the last word. That's the gospel. 
It's come. The kingdom has come in Christ. His life, death, resurrection, and enthronement, that is his ascension. Because of all these things, the powers of sin and death no longer have the last word. And if that's our definition of the gospel, what the gospel can begin to do is this beautiful uh, reality, forming this beautiful reality that a new family made up of vastly different people can become possible in Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. And so, this is what revolutionized the world 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Paul wrote these words in the book of Ephesians. And he's trying to help the church understand what has happened in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul begins by uh, chapter 2 by talking about the ways that Christ has rescued us. And so uh, in verse 1, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when you were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the problem with the human condition is not that we are morally inconsistent people. The problem with the human condition is not that we mess up here and there. That's much too optimistic a picture of the human condition. What Paul is saying is not that we mess up here and there and that we struggle with morality. The issue about the human condition is that we're dead. And we need to be made alive in Jesus Christ. And so the gospel is not just the good news that bad people can become good. Or good people can become better. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that dead people can be made alive. Amen. And that life has already been tasted by those who have said yes to Jesus Christ. Now for Paul, he doesn't stop there. In verse 14, he continues with this amazing news. And so in verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its command and regulations. His purpose, amen, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Look at the genius of Paul here. He begins by talking about how God has made us alive in Jesus Christ, giving us access to salvation. In Christ, we have access to the Father. In Christ, we have been made whole. In Christ, we are set free. In Christ, we are forgiven. In Christ, we are rescued. And another part of the Bible, the image that gets at this is that when Jesus died, In the temple, Matthew 27 says that the curtain was torn in two. That at one point, we did not have access to the holies of holies. But when Jesus Christ died, at the moment he died, the the, the curtain that separated us between us and God was torn in half. (laughs) Signifying that we have access to God signifying that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, signifying that we have the full privileges of sons and daughters of God. But this is not the end of the Christian salvation story. Paul lets us know that salvation has a vertical dimension and salvation has a horizontal dimension. And our salvation has to do with our relationship to God and our relationship to one another. And so follow Paul's flow of thought. We have peace with God. But in Christ, additionally, the walls that separated Jew from Gentile came down as well. 
Now, within the temple, there were people that would worship, and there were places where the Gentiles could hang out, and it was only as far as they could go. There were walls, there were gates that said, Gentiles, you can stay over here, Jews stay over here, and then very special people can get even further and further to the presence of God. But look at what Paul says. In Christ, all the walls that separated us, not just from God, but from one another, have come down. Now, here's the point. A Christianity that only focuses on curtains being torn without any regard for the walls that separate us is not Christianity. And we have, it's so easy to have a faith that focuses on the curtains. Oh, I love the curtains. Oh, I can talk to God. I'm a child of God. This is wonderful. But if the curtain comes down but the walls stay up, it's not the full picture of the Christian salvation story. And we are invited not just to tear down the curtain. Amen. We are invited as well to tear down the walls as well. Which is why the cross of Jesus Christ is not just a bridge that gets us to God. It's a sledgehammer that tears down walls that separate us. Usually when we hear about the gospel and people give out tracts and everything, it's usually humanity on one side and God on the other. And there's this massive chasm and there's a bridge between the chasm that we can walk over and it's shaped in the cross. And it's a nice image, but it's an incomplete image of the Christian story. Because the cross is not just a bridge. The cross is a sledgehammer that tears down walls that separate us. You see... God is not interested simply in saving individuals. God is interested in forming a new people, a new humanity, a new way of belonging to one another. And this was a revelation. When Paul wrote this some 2,000 years ago, this was a revelation. This was staggering because Jews viewed Gentiles as religiously unclean and Gentiles viewed Jews as less than human. And yet something happened in Christ Jesus. That in Christ a new humanity is made possible. That in Christ God has made a way to join those of us who were separated from one another to become one new family. That in Christ, God has done away with the laws and the regulations that used to keep people at a distance from one another. That in Christ, amen, God has made it possible for a new way of relating to one another. That in Christ, the promise that was given to Abraham that, a, that the world will be blessed through him has been fulfilled. That in Christ, the downward spiral of our human relationships and violence and war and oppression can come to an end because something has happened in Christ. And yet, there's a problem. Sin is still at work. Humanity cannot accomplish this on our own and instead of living into this beautiful gospel image we find ourselves stuck the united states finds itself stuck and not just the outside world the church is stuck Dr. King famously said it's appalling that the most segregated hour of the christian of christian america is 11 o'clock on Sunday. In the United States, 14% of churches are known as diverse, and it's a very low standard of diversity for that 14%. 86% are homogenous communities, and yet the gospel is called to break through, to show what's possible when Jesus Christ is at the center. And yet, here's something super important that we have to recognize in our super diverse congregation where over 75 nations gather for worship, where in this neighborhood over 123 languages are spoken. There is a truth that we all need to hear within this congregation, and it is this, that just because a church is diverse doesn't mean it's a reflection of the kingdom. That the lack of emotional and spiritual maturity to navigate 
the racial moment and climate we're in is glaring. That the fractures and fragmentation of racism reminds us that there's something wrong with the ways we understand the gospel. And it's not just out there. It's in here, within our own community. And here's what I've discovered as I begin my 14th year as a pastor at New Life Fellowship Church. That just because a community is diverse doesn't mean it's without its problems. Last year, after George Floyd's murder, there were tensions within our community. Some wondered why many in our congregation would participate in a prayer protest on Queens Boulevard. There are some in our community who saw Black Lives Matter signs and concluded that I and others in our church were like aligning with that organization, which, by the way, has never been true. Black Lives Matter the way that I use it and we use it at New is a theological affirmation, not a political organizational statement. <laughs> it, to say Black Lives Matter is to say that black men and women and children are to be treated with the greatest of human dignity, be treated fairly, be treated with love. It's a theological statement. And so this message is not for some monocultural church in Georgia. This message is for our diverse church in Queens. What does it mean to be committed to racial reconciliation? What are the signs that we are living a gospel of reconciliation? What does it mean that the walls are coming down in our own community? Well, first of all, I want to define a few things. First of all, reconciliation. The word reconciliation is a beautiful theological word, but it's often been seen culturally as something much less than it is biblically. And so when people hear the word reconciliation, they often hear a bunch of diverse people gathering together and singing. And we're like, wow, look how reconciled this community is. Here's the problem with that. You can get all of this at a Beyonce concert. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. A whole bunch of different people singing, knowing the words. Uh, we're no different than a Beyonce concert if that's how we define reconciliation. But reconciliation is more than just a group of diverse people singing next to one another. It's something much more profound. I like how Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil has addressed this. One of my favorite definitions on what reconciliation is. And she says, reconciliation is the ongoing spiritual process involving forgiveness, repentance, and justice that restores broken relationships and systems to reflect God's original intention for all creation to flourish. Mm, that's good. <laughs> Let this be our way of understanding reconciliation, the ongoing. This stuff is ongoing for the rest of our lives. We're wrestling with this. The spiritual process involving forgiveness, repentance, justice that restores broken relationships and systems to reflect God's original intention for all creation to flourish. And so if that's our working definition and we see what Paul has said, that the walls of hostility has come down in the name of Jesus, what does it look like for us? How do we work towards this as a community? How do we do it? I don't want to talk about people in Brooklyn and, and, and other churches. How do we as a community work on this? Well, what I want to offer are five signs that we are demonstrating this gospel. Five signs that we are taking this value seriously. Five signs that we are doing the work individually and the work as a community together. Five signs that walls are coming down in the name of Jesus. Here's the first one. The first sign is that we normalize the complexity of being this new family. That it is complicated to be in this community. Listen, there are four Puerto Ricans who live in my home. And we have a hard time navigating all of our differences. Imagine when you start getting a whole bunch of people 
from different racial, ethnic, socioeconomic backgrounds trying to make life happen. It is complicated. It is very complex, which means that there are going to be conflicts that emerge. And whenever conflicts emerge within our community and disagreements emerge within our community, we have two options. The first option is to say, this is an unhealthy community. Wow, look at the disagreements. Look at the tensions. Or you can say, this is a human community. Wow, look at, because if you go somewhere else, you're going to find the same thing somewhere else. No matter where you go. Puff Daddy said it this way. He said, more money, more problems. Uh, it's more people, more problems. More different people, more problems. This is the norm. And so we would do well to normalize the complexity of being this new family. I didn't have Puff Daddy in my notes, but the Spirit just gave me that. The Spirit just gave me that there. It's complicated to live in this reality, which means because it's so complex, because it's so complicated, we have to recognize that at any given point in our community, someone is not going to be happy. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I, for our Christmas Eve service, we typically read various passages of the Christmas story in various languages. And I never forget one uh, Christmas Eve service where someone came up to me and asked me a question. It wasn't mean-spirited. It was, you know, just like, Pastor Rich, when is my language going to be read for the Christmas Eve service? And my response was more like a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it was just like, it was like 2016, whatever. I was just like, I think your language is uh, for 2019. I mean, is this 20... We're on, we're on schedule for 2019. In other words, when, when there's 123 languages spoken in the neighborhood and 75 nations represented in our community, not everyone's language is going to be spoken on a Christmas Eve service. That'll be a six-hour service. Santa came, Santa left. We're still reading the scriptures. The kids are upset. I'm tired. 2019, that's when we're reading your passage. And so it's complicated. The complexity of it all, which means we are to be so humble and teachable because of the complexity of this. We are to be curious and attentive, knowing that we all have blind spots and we need one another to help us navigate the complexity of being a diverse community. One of my own areas of continual growth is how I have understood the Asian and Asian American community in my, my past 13 years at New Life. Growing up in Brooklyn in my Puerto Rican family, and I think this is probably true for maybe about 70% of Puerto Ricans, and I'm probably being generous with that number, that Puerto Ricans often view Asians as a, one group of people. Everyone's Chinese for Puerto Ricans. And it's probably 90% of Puerto Ricans who think this. And so when I came to New Life, one of my ongoing areas of understanding nuance and understanding complexity and understanding how challenging it is to be in a community was I needed help. I remember preaching a sermon. It was either 2011 or 2012. And I got up here and very just proudly said, you know what, I've been coming to this church for three years and I'm learning so much about Asians. I'm learning so much about Asians. And Pastor Pete, who was here at the first service. It was so good to see the Italian stallion at the first service there. <laughs> he, 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 he came up to me after the service, as we typically do, and he said, Rich, great sermon, but, but, but listen, that statement about you're learning so much about Asians, uh, you know, you can't lump everyone into a word. It, it's very, it, it's vast. Asia is vast. And so he coached me, and he said, the second service, this is, I think, what you should say. We have people from all over Asia. 
people from China and Korea and Indonesia and Singapore and Malaysia and Bhutan and, and, and India and, 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 all, and, and Pakistan and all over the place. And I'm learning about the complexities and the nuances of Asian culture. I, didn't, I don't think I got a standing ovation in the second service, but I realized I needed help. And you need help. We all need help. It's complicated. And what we must do is normalize the complexity. Otherwise, we will say, what kind of church is this? And you're going to go to somebody else's church and find the same problem there. That's number one. Number two. To be a community that works for racial reconciliation and this vision of Ephesians 2 requires us to explore our own racial formation. We all have been formed by our families. We all have been formed by our relatives. We all have been formed by the surrounding culture to have internalized messages about people who don't look like us, about people who come from a different place in the world from us. We all have to wrestle with this and grow in our own awareness. To some degree, we all have standards by which we measure what's beautiful and what's not, who's trustworthy and who's not, who's competent and who's not. And so much of this is so racialized that we, it's so second nature to us. That if we're not working hard to identify the ways that we have been shaped by our families, our cultures, the world around us, we will perpetuate the fragmentation and the hostility within our own community. Which is why a couple of years ago I created this very little inventory, a simple inventory, to talk about racism and our family of origin. That our families consciously or unconsciously handed down messages to us. And unless we are exploring these messages, we're not going to live this Ephesians 2 vision. And this kind of examination can lead to lots of shame. Because when you actually name the ways that you see different people, it's shameful. It's embarrassing. And yet part of the work of our own reconciliation is to confess these things. There's an assessment, and, and I want you to listen to this message later on this week or, or, or take a picture of the screen here, but, but there's a, a simple inventory that we would all do well to give ourselves to. How did your family talk about these groups of people? What messages did you get about black people growing up, about white people? about Asian people, East Asian, South Asian, Asian American, etc., Latino, Hispanic people, Native American, Middle Eastern. What are the messages that you've received from your families? You say, oh, my family, we're just a good Christian people. We don't have... No, what are the messages? When you saw a certain person walking down the street... Did a family member say, let's cross the street? When you're looking for a doctor and saw a name that you can't pronounce, did you conclude this person must not know English? We've all been shaped by our surrounding culture and by our families. Additional questions for our own reflection is, who are the people you were taught to fear? Who are the people you were taught were beneath you? What assumptions about the groups of people listed do you hold? And if we just did this, brothers and sisters, this week, spend our times navigating our own racial formation, we will begin to live more into this Ephesians 2 vision where the walls of hostility come down. But it requires us to navigate our own racial formation. Here's the third sign. How do we know the walls are coming down in the name of Jesus? How do, we, how do we know we're working for this? Thirdly, we lament 
and resist the racial sins that continue to shape our world today. We lament and resist the racial sins that continue to shape our world today. To be a community that wrestles faithfully with racial reconciliation requires us to lament the ways that racism has damaged our world. And I want to just try to define racism in a way that's much more comprehensive than we typically understand it to be. It was Michael Emerson, a Christian sociologist at Baylor University, who, who said that the ways that we typically understand racism is this. Racism is usually defined as intended individual acts of overt prejudice and discrimination. And so if we're not doing that, we say, I have no problem with racism. It's intended, meaning I meant to do it. It's individual. It has something to do with just me as an individual. And it's overt. It's clear as day. And we say, if, if I'm not doing any of that, then I don't have a problem with racism. But racism is more than just intended individual acts of overt prejudice and discrimination. There are layers to it. I found a professor at Columbia University, uh, uh, Gerard Wing Su, a professor of psychology and education, who provided, I believe, a, a much more helpful, expansive view of racism, where he says that racism comprises attitudes, actions, institutional structure, or social policies that subordinate persons or groups because of their color. That to talk responsibly about racism means we must look at it individually, interpersonally, and institutionally. Only then can we really address the demon of racism. Only then can we really push back the power and principality that is racism. Only then when we're recognizing the multiple layers that are at work can we begin to bear witness to this gospel of reconciliation. And so... We cannot understand our current reality without taking seriously the sins of the past. In Canada this past week, Canada this past Thursday had its first national day for truth and reconciliation. And the day was announced in June by the government as a day for all Canadians to listen and learn about the country's colonial history and the ongoing trauma caused by residential schools. If you've been following the news about these unmarked graves all throughout Canada, part of these residential schools, the horror of it all, the ways that indigenous people have been treated for, for God knows how long. We cannot move forward unless we examine where we've been. Here is a new life principle. We have to go back in order to go forward. We cannot understand our racial situation without sincerely examining the effects of Native American genocide, of slavery, of Jim Crow laws, of Japanese internment camps, of the Chinese Exclusion Act, of the ways that these realities have been the foundation, arguably, for anti-Asian violence, for police brutality, for redlining, for housing discrimination, and we are to resist all of these things in the name of Jesus. <laughs> this should not be controversial. And so it means to be part of this community. I can't speak for other churches, but to be part of this community here, it means we join our voices and join our lives to those who are mistreated, those who are overlooked, those who are under-resourced. And, and sometimes 
This does mean protesting, and sometimes this means community organizing, and sometimes it means deep listening, and sometimes it means working for better policies, and sometimes it means praying and marching around the community in the name of Jesus, casting down the strongholds, but we are called to lament and resist the ways that racial sins continue to shape our experience today. Fourthly, We practice repentance and forgiveness. To be a community marked by Ephesians 2. To be a community marked by that beautiful definition of reconciliation means that we continuously practice repentance. You know, one of the reasons why we have a prayer of confession every single Sunday is because it orients us in a particular way. It reminds us weekly that we fall short. It reminds us weekly that we don't have our act together. It reminds us weekly that we need the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And so we are called to practice repentance and forgiveness if we're going to be part of this community, which means we repent of our blind spots. We repent of our insensitivity. We repent of our stereotypes. We repent, we repent, we repent, and by God's grace, we forgive. By God's grace, we don't carry the burden of resentment. By God's grace, we live freely, forgiving in the name of Jesus. Freely he's forgiven us and freely we offer forgiveness. We repent and we forgive. And if we're going to be part of this community, this community will not survive unless we're repenting and forgiving. And so the next time you say, well, I can't believe what happened at this church, I'm out of here. Now, hold on a second. We all have work to do of repentance. And we all have work to do with forgiveness. Fifthly, and then we're going to take communion together. If we're going to live into this Ephesians 2 vision, we must cling to Jesus Christ. Christ is our peace. This is why last week when we're talking about contemplative rhythms of prayer and seeking God, we cannot focus on doing what I'm talking about today without focusing on what we talked about last week. Our lives are to be rooted in prayer, clinging to Jesus Christ, that something has happened in him, in his death and in his resurrection, in the sending of the Holy Spirit. Because of Christ, the new world has been born. And we are called to cling to him. And as we cling to him, his spirit has a way of animating our lives. That we're following in his way. We will find ourselves living a way marked by self-giving love. A way of forgiveness. A way of justice. A way of reconciliation. We must cling to Jesus. He is our peace. And as we give ourselves to just these five principles, and certainly there's more, may we be the community that Jesus Christ dreamed about when he died for us. A community marked by wholeness and love and forgiveness and justice and reconciliation. And may we do it in the power of his spirit. Amen. What a wonderful way to come to the table of communion. Before we come to the table, I want to give us a moment for our own confession before God, our own repentance before God. Maybe if you just spent a moment thinking about what are those messages that you have about black people, white people, and Asian people, and Native American, Middle Eastern. Maybe there's something that, as I was preaching, you're saying, Holy Spirit, there's some work to do here. Where is the point of repentance 
that you need to offer before the Lord. I want to give you a few, maybe 30, 40 seconds, maybe just to name it in your soul. And then we'll pray a prayer of confession on the screen. Let's pray this prayer of confession. We have it on the screen together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and our neighbor through our own fault, in thought, in word, and deed, in what we have done and what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Let's all stand together. I invite you to, uh, those of you at home, maybe you have the elements in front of you. For those of us in this room here, you can be, begin to try to loosen um, those elements there. The Bible says the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you I was broken so that you might become whole do this in remembrance of me the people of God, let's receive the body of Jesus Christ. the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns as the people of God forgiven and reconciled through the poured out blood of Jesus Christ let's all receive together Lord, thank you for the gifts of your body and your blood. You made a way that we would be in communion with the living God, but you also made a way that we would be in communion with one another as well. So make these elements form us to be a people marked by this gospel news of reconciliation. We sing to you now words of praise. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing as a response together. Let's sing this together. God of my presence, God of my future, you write my story.
Something has happened in Jesus Christ that a new humanity is possible. May we cling to the God of all peace to live into that beautiful truth. As we close our gathering, let's have our prayer team come to my left. Some of you have come into our worship today and you're tired, you're hurting, you're struggling with your faith some challenges at home. You just need someone to pray for you, pray with you. And so for whatever need you have, uh, we want to pray for you. We, we spent so much time alone worshiping throughout the course of this pandemic that now that we have an opportunity to gather in person in this way, if you're sensing you just need someone to pray for you, don't pass up this opportunity. What a gift we have to be the body of Christ one with another. For those of you uh, watching online, uh, as we mentioned last week, we're not going to have a sermon discussion time that will resume in uh, a few weeks. But if you're watching online or maybe you're in this room and there's something coming up in your soul, maybe you hear the voice of God crying out deep in your soul saying, come to me. I want to forgive you. I want to pour out my love on you. I want to save you. And if you're at a place where you're like, I need the life of God. I've tried to live without following Jesus and receiving his life. But today, something's stirring up inside of me. And if you're sensing that in your soul today, you could come up to our prayer team. We'd love to pray for you. You can also text this phrase, yes to Jesus. 718-424-0122. Again, 718-424-0122. And we want to serve you as you take your next step and what it means to live in this world and follow Christ. As we close our service, let me invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. Uh, for those of you who are new here, I'll be outside in on the lobby, some of our, in the porch area, some of our pastors will be there as well. And uh, we'd love to connect with you. Those of you online, thank you for worshiping with us and singing with us and putting comments in the chat section and connecting there. It's so wonderful to have you part of our worship gathering as well. As we close, let me bless you with these words. Brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building and out of this online gathering in the power of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness to the truth that something has happened in Jesus Christ, that a new humanity is possible. And little by little, may you grow into that new humanity, bear witness to that new humanity, and show the world what is possible when Jesus Christ gets a hold of someone's life. I bless you all in the strong, in the beautiful, in the reconciling name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Grace and peace to you all.